I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today we're continuing my community ranking series as we take a look at the boss difficulty from Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. I asked my community to rank every major boss in Sekiro from a score of 1 to 10, with 1 being insanely easy, 10 being insanely hard. I then tally the votes, work out the averages, bish, bash, bosh. Sekiro is a game that I was very curious about because personally, I think of all the Souls games, it's got the highest barrier for entry. But once you understand the combat system, each encounter can be trivialized and made significantly easier with the right skills and tools. I didn't include the inner boss variants on this list because they're updates to existing bosses, meaning we'd be covering the same ground for the most part. Plus, I haven't beaten them myself. I think that could be a future video idea. However, I did allow my voters, if they wanted, to vote on which inner boss was the toughest for them in an entirely optional part of the poll. Inegini Chiro came in third place with 25 votes, Inna Ishin came in second place with 102 votes, while Inner Father came in first place with 137 votes. Now then, let's not waste any more time. My community's easiest to hardest Sekiro Shadows Die Twice bosses ranked. Let me know your hardest boss down below. At number 16, we have the Folding Screen Monkeys, who scored a total average of 1.76 out of 10. I don't think this comes as a shock to anybody who's played Sekiro, but the puzzle boss ends up taking the moniker of easiest fight in the game, and I can't really argue with the logic. 246 votes for easiest boss, and 62 votes for least favourite boss, the community just doesn't enjoy a puzzle. The folding screen monkeys themselves don't actually attack you during the fight, instead you have to chase the four of them down within the Halls of Illusion, with the aim being to kill all four to end the spell. To do this, you can interact with the environment and figure out each monkey's unique weakness, or you can just chase them around like an absolute madman and hope you catch a lucky break. At any point, you can refresh the remaining monkeys, ringing the elusive hall bell you obtain at the start of the fight, because sometimes a monkey will just yeet itself into the void for no apparent reason. Based on the ancient Three Wise Monkeys proverb, each of your foes relies on a different sense. See no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, and do no evil. The first three are found across the temple, and you have to use their weaknesses to overcome them. For example, the green monkey has extremely poor vision, so corner it in a dark room and you can sneak up for major damage. The only tricky monkey is do no evil, as the white monkey plays a devious trick. He'll always appear invisibly behind the player, sometimes leaving behind spectral footprints. If you're not aware of this mechanic, it could take a long time to find him. But if you know, you can kill that monkey immediately after the fight starts, giving you a leg up on the other three. The only other danger comes from the spectral monkeys that sometimes spawn, which inflict terror damage on the player. If terror reaches maximum, you immediately die. And those monkeys don't despawn if you ring the elusive hall bell, so kill them when you can. At some point in the future, I'll be getting my partner to play Sekiro for the first time, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how he handles a puzzle boss with no prior knowledge. On to the voters. I think the folding screen monkeys get way too much hate. Sure, they aren't as action-packed as many other bosses, but they're not trying to be. They're a puzzle boss, and each of the monkeys has more than one way of dealing with them. One of the main complaints I've seen with them is that it's just a bunch of running around and feels random, when there's literally an NPC telling you not to do that. When you take your time, think about your order you want to kill the monkeys and how, I find them to be a genuinely enjoyable experience. So while I don't think folding screen monkeys aren't anywhere near the best fight in the game, I still think Sekiro would be a worse game without them. The monkeys are a welcome change of pace in a game where most of the bosses feature intense swordplay and shinobi action. Plus, the amount of care put into their design to adhere to the actual proverbs they were based on is really impressive. One of FromSoft's better puzzle bosses if you fight them as intended. I think folding screen monkeys are the easiest by far in difficulty terms, as I did not understand what I was supposed to do on my first playthrough, and so I just put my controller aside to search the web on how to defeat them, and then proceeded to slay them afterwards. I feel like the ghost monkeys should be always following you, just to keep the player on edge the whole time. 
Perhaps it would have been better for FromSoft to leave the NPC who gives you hints next to the folding screens themselves, because it seems many players often miss that he's there, thus creating frustration that leads to googling the answers. Not everyone's going to latch onto the concept of a puzzle boss, and I won't shame anyone for needing to look up help. As for the ghost monkeys, if you don't kill the invisible monkey first, he'll spawn ghost spirits behind you as you fight, and the only other enemy that summons them is the orange monkey due to his focus as a lookout. I think they're well balanced. It's not a fight that's designed to keep the player on edge, it's a fight designed to make you slow down and think. Folding Screen Monkeys is by far the easiest boss in the game. It's a gimmick boss, but you don't even really have to engage with the gimmick. On my first playthrough, I didn't lure the monkeys into their corresponding rooms, I just ran around until I killed them all, which was still incredibly easy. And this is how I tend to run through the fight myself these days. I engaged with the puzzle back in the day, but now I'm more into just getting through the fight and getting my mortal blade as quickly as possible. Plus, it does feel satisfying when you catch a monkey outside of their intended feedback loop. Doesn't stop them from being easy though, as the difficulty stems from a lack of knowledge, and once you have that knowledge, there is no difficulty. At number 15, we have the Divine Dragon, who scored a total average of 2.58 out of 10, with 72 votes for easiest boss. The ruler of the Fountainhead Palace, and by far the largest creature you'll face on your journey, there's an argument to be made that there was a lot of missed potential for making a truly difficult battle out of attempting to defeat this godlike creature. But I really like how the fight feels more like a test to see whether humanity is worthy to claim the dragon's tears and end the cycle of immortality. Phase 1 is a footnote that sees you trying to kill various avatars that spawn around Wolf. You have to wait for large roots to spawn, grapple to the top of the prominent one that remains, and then do a plunging death blow on any enemy of your choice. Wolf will then swing that enemy around like a weapon, defeating any minions surrounding him at the time. Very Dynasty Warriors, and very satisfying to pull off. After you do enough damage, the dragon reveals itself, and Phase 2 begins. Since this is a safe space, I'm going to admit I died to this boss multiple times during my first playthrough of the game, because I found the wind slices incredibly hard to dodge. Now with a lot of practice, I can see how telegraphed the Divine Dragon's attacks are, and aside from the last phase where it can combo stagger you with multiple slices, you shouldn't have any trouble. I love using the lightning reversal technique to do damage, having to grapple to the root that's about to be struck by lightning so you can projectile zap the boss for major damage. If you're observant enough, you can see where the next lightning strike is going to be and eviscerate the boss's health bar on your first cycle. But eventually, you'll be pushed back and forced to make the trek towards the dragon again. Rinse and repeat until the boss is down and you cut the tears from its pupil. It ranks above the folding screen monkeys because, to be blunt, its attacks are actually designed to kill you. You're more likely to die in a fight where the boss is actively trying to attack the player. Not a lot of divine dragon comments from the voters, but we do have a couple to share. An excellent but easy gimmick fight. This fight is mostly about the spectacle, but dodging the flurry of attacks in the final phase can be a bit tricky. I don't mind spending a while on this fight though, because the spectacle is breathtaking. It's easily one of the strongest spectacle fights in the franchise, and this voter echoes my sentiments pretty well. That last phase where you have to pay attention to the combos being thrown at you is a lot of fun, and whether you dodge or deflect the wind slices, the atmosphere is off the charts. I absolutely love the Divine Dragon. It might not be mechanically complex or particularly difficult, but it manages to be so emotionally impactful that I'm willing to forgive that. The first phase feels like a purification ritual, drawing the illness out of the old dragons. In contrast, the second phase is a spectacle that still manages to feel so graceful, like the divine dragon is testing us, seeing if we are worthy of its gracious gift of tears. Great observation with the first phase. The rejuvenating waters, as well as the search for immortality, has led to a lot of illness and strife in the lands of Ashina, so it's only fitting that for us to receive the dragon's tears, we must first overcome that impurity ourselves. It could even be symbolic of the illness within Wolf himself as a recipient of Kuro's gift of immortality. 
With Sekiro's focus on telling a cohesive story compared to the rest of the Souls games, it's only fitting we have a boss that truly feels like a story fight from start to finish. At number 14, we have... Kyobu Masataka Oniwa! Who scored a total average of 3.8 out of 10, and the last boss on today's list to score beneath a 5 in difficulty. He comes at the end of the Ashina outskirts, so by the time you reach his rather iconic boss arena, a battlefield outside the castle gates, you're more prepared to face down your foe. You've likely also visited the Harata estate at this point, meaning you've gotten a few extra shinobi tools, you've got more skill tree techniques under your belt, hell, some of you may have already defeated Lady Butterfly. Because of this, Gyobu and his horse end up feeling a lot easier than players expect. His challenge comes from how his spear is attached to a rope, allowing him to swing it around the arena and hit you from afar. Close up, his attacks are easy to deflect and don't pose much of a threat after all. I love that the fight gives you a ton of options to close distance. Maybe you'll just run after him because Wolf's running speed is incredibly quick. Or you can use the grappling hook to launch yourself across the battlefield, getting some healthy posture damage as you land. And of course, because Gyobu rides a horse, he ends up being incredibly weak to the shinobi firecrackers. Stockpile enough of them and you can stun him multiple times throughout the fight while providing insane posture damage. If you miss the firecrackers though, the fight is still fully possible with just your deflection skills and attacks, as Gyobu gives so many opportunities for the player to do damage. Whether you take him down via posture or health, his fight can be easily overcome. Compared to the rest of the boss roster who all feel far more aggressive, you just get more downtime with this fight, and that's exactly what we needed. He rewards you for learning the game's mechanics and exploring the outskirts while providing enough of a challenge that players can't just breeze past him. There's only one voter I want to highlight for this section, but because they succinctly explain exactly what makes him a fantastic boss, take it away. Gyobu is a fantastic first major boss. He's not that hard, but the mobility of his horse, wide sweeps, and imposing presence is unlike anything you see before him. The game also rewards your use of shinobi tools in this fight. Without them, you can still win, but making use of the grappling hook and firecrackers make this boss noticeably easier without removing all the challenge since the boss grows wise to it after a few uses. Yeah, you summed up my thoughts, including the fact that the firecrackers aren't an instant win button. Yes, you'll do posture damage, but if you become over-reliant on the strategy, you'll find Gyobu's horse doesn't always remain stunned. A cheeky spear to the face might be your reward instead. There's a reason why I ranked Gobu as one of the best first bosses in Soulsborne last year. I believe I had him at second place, and I still firmly stand by that assessment. At number 13, we have Lady Butterfly, who scored a total average of 5.26 out of 10. The step up from the first three bosses on today's list to her is immense, with Lady Butterfly being the first true difficulty spike of the game. In her first phase, she relies on fast combos, slices, and kicks to overcome the player, and if you don't adapt to her fast pace, you're gonna find yourself on the back foot. The worst thing you can do is run away. The best way to counter the Butterfly is to stay close, deflect her combos, and keep putting on the pressure. You'll have to learn how to react to her perilous attacks, jumping over her low sweeps, or using a well-placed shuriken to knock her down whenever she goes up into the air with her wires. This also does good posture damage, so it's worth waiting for those moments when you can. Most of Sekiro's tougher fights are rhythm-based, attacks have a cadence to them, a timing, and once you figure out each combo's timing, you can deflect them with serious skill. It's her phase 2 that brings in the difficulty, though. Lady Butterfly will continue with her Phase 1 moveset, while also summoning extra magic butterfly projectiles that home in on the player. Staying close will allow some of them to sail over your head, but they do decent damage if they hit, so you need to watch your health. The main danger though comes from her large-scale illusion spell, where she'll summon a horde of illusory spirits that can harm the player. If you have a Snap Seed, you can break the spell immediately, allowing you to continue the fight safely. If not, you'll want to keep fighting Lady Butterfly until you begin to see the spell fade. Then, run like a madman and pray the magic follow-up attacks don't hit you. 
On my winning run for my recorded playthrough, I was able to kill her during her first delusion attack because she didn't have enough time to cast it due to me keeping close to her. Get in her personal space, you'll come out on top. We're gonna ignore that her AI can be very easily cheesed though. You have to consciously choose to use that method, as most players won't discover her weakness to simple dodging on a first run. Such an underrated fight in this game, the women really let us have it throughout. As for the voters, well... Lady Butterfly is amazing. She really tests your understanding of every facet of the game's mechanics, while still helping you understand the full scope of your abilities. And she's hard enough so that beating her feels like a huge victory. All of the early game bosses feel like they're there to teach the player about different facets of the game. For Lady Butterfly, it's a case of environmental awareness, and an introduction to the more supernatural and underhanded aspects we'll see in later bosses. I remember my first time beating her, I felt such a wave of euphoria because of how long it took me to get her patterns down. Lady Butterfly Phase 1 does such a good job at showing you that deflection is your best method of offense, and teaches you how baiting her into attacking you so that you can deflect and building up her posture bar, i.e. constantly engaging with the boss, is the optimal method of tackling her, a theme present in most Sekiro bosses hereafter. It's a shame that the second phase punishes aggression and gives her moves where you have little choice but to deal with clones and not focus on the boss, resetting her posture meter. The additional things she summons with attacks not being deflectable and forcing you to disengage also exacerbates this issue. Uh, perhaps I had a different experience, but I've never felt that aggression in Phase 2 was punished by the game. One or two magic projectiles aside, my winning run I continued to push her into a corner, giving her no quarter, and it felt very successful. The only move that goes against this is her main illusion attack, a valid complaint if you're going for a posture kill, though my counter argument would be you've likely done decent health damage to her prior to that point, which means even if her posture meter decreases, it'll increase at a quicker pace once you're back in melee range. Her magic should have been deflectable though, I fully agree on that front. Lady Butterfly is significantly more difficult than most people give her credit for. Sure, while she can be done late game and brute force like nothing, or even tackled pretty simply as your first boss in the game, her consistency makes her even harder than Gyobu to master. Her kick combos feel unnaturally weird to deflect, unlike most bosses with sword swings that are so fluid you can pick up their combos with relative ease. Add in the mobility in clones, making keeping consistent posture damage tricky unless you have a consumable item, the shurikens with varying patterns, and butterflies that can't be deflected without chip damage, and it's a brutal fight to get truly good at. While I still think Demon of Hatred is a harder boss straight up, Lady Butterfly is undoubtedly the hardest to master. Honestly, it says a lot that despite Lady Butterfly being near the bottom of the rankings, she has so many defenders who will actively fight for her fight being one of the toughest in the game. Her combos feel tough to block if you're a visual learner. For me, the trick was to count the timings in my head and repeat them back whenever a new combo gets thrown out, which gave me an easier experience. The second phase is where most of the difficulty lies, though. I never knew just how many people found the illusion attack frustrating. Perhaps because I enjoy the fight so much, I never minded seeing my posture bar reset afterwards? I was just back to the grind, but I respect that's not the case for a lot of people out there. Honestly, hot take, she is too low on this ranking. There are a handful of bosses I'd rank beneath her, but that's why the community rules the roost today. At number 12, we have the Corrupted Monk, who scored a total average of 5.46 out of 10. Found at the end of Mibu Village, this apparition stands as a guardian keeping people out of Mibu Village's sacred cave. Compared to some of the entries on this list, there's not actually a lot to say here. The Corrupted Monk is the first phase of a different boss fight given a spectral form and told, Have at you! The fight can be cheesed relatively easily with snap seeds that take massive chunks out of her health, and with just a singular health bar, the battle will be decided within a few moments. The only attack of any note is her Whirlwind, where she'll launch into a vast series of Beyblade-style attacks with surprisingly tough-to-time deflects. If you can learn the timing of this move, you're in the clear for the rest of the fight, as it leaves her vulnerable, builds up a ton of posture very quickly, and is her only threatening attack. Otherwise, the arena is large enough that you can outrun the first few hits, then block the last couple so your posture meter doesn't break. 
You can Makiri counter her perilous thrust and jump over her perilous sweep, and if you need distance to heal, you can outrun her assuming she doesn't use her jump attack to close distance. You need to deal damage due to her high health pool, as trying to kill her via posture from the start of the fight is a fool's errand. But get her to half health and a posture death blow is less a dream and more a reality. Do the voters have more to say about her than me? Probably. False Corrupted Monk is one of my favourite fights in Sekiro for how pure its difficulty feels. It's just a one-on-one -on -one bout with one huge health and posture bar that all comes down to your understanding of the boss's moveset, timings, and attack windows. No tricks, minimal exploits, speedrun tricks aren't factoring into my difficulty rankings, just a really fun but challenging fight. In that sense, I fully see the vision. Sometimes you just want a pure battle of skill with minimal bullshit. No terror, no phase two, and in that sense, the corrupted monk delivers. I do think she's a bit of an anti-climax, given the other story path you take at this point in the game leads to the Guardian Ape, one of the game's more in-depth boss fights, but if you found enjoyment through her, that's fair enough. The false corrupted monk at the end of Mibu Village is, to me, the easiest and also least favourite boss. I never had any trouble with her at all, in fact I was really surprised that Orin didn't drop a memory item, and even more surprised that the corrupted monk right down the road from her did. It's just not special. The only moves worth noting are samey swipes, a stab, and a samey swipe that FromSoft wants you to think is special because a red marker appears. She's also weak to everything, mortal draw, jumping on her head like you're playing Mario, Makiri counters, firecrackers, and even just plain green beans that take out a huge chunk of her health bar for some reason. It seemed like way more of a mini-boss to me than a full-fledged boss, and that's why I don't like it as much as any other boss. I do think the real monk makes up for it, but the corrupted monk just seems kinda useless to me. You fight the real one, like, only an hour after? It does feel like a stiff breeze can overcome the corrupted monk when you look at it from that perspective. I'm more in line with this commenter, as I definitely struggled more with the Orin mini-boss than I ever did with corrupted monk. To be fair to the game though, every boss is weak to the mortal draw, <laughs> that move was my go-to skill because it just damages everything it hits. Mikuri counters I'm also fine with, it's a purchasable skill, which some people forget. Imagine doing a Makiri counterless playthrough, oh god. But I do agree that with how soon you face the true corrupted monk after the Mibu Village variant, it didn't really need to be there in the first place, and only served to water down the difficulty of the main fight's first phase. I'm still in shock she landed above Lady Butterfly, I'ma be real with y'all. At number 11, we have Emma, the Gentle Blade, who scored a total average of 5.61 out of 10. Initially, fought as part of the Shura ending questline, you're required to fight her and Ishin Ashina back to back in order to get the darkest ending of the game. However, I rank the pair separately because Sekiro specifically has a boss rematch system that allows you to face Emma by herself and this allows players to experience her fight without that added pressure of Ishin right after. Despite having a singular health bar, Emma has no problem flexing on the player with her Ashina arts, having been taught by Ishin himself to the point where their movesets are very similar. As most people do the Shura ending last, you'll have the knowledge of Ishin's Sword Saint Phase 1, which can then be transferred over to Emma. Her attacks hit hard, and a bad deflect can see you fully on the back foot, but our danger comes from her grab attack. She will bend the whims of time and space so she can flip you over her head and there is nothing you can do to stop her. Her attacks are calculated, precise, and she holds absolutely nothing back. Every time I talk about her fight, I like to bring up how clinical she is. Her ability to target weak spots with precision befits her role as a doctor, and how she channels that into her fighting style is inspired. Once you understand her pattern, she becomes a relatively easy foe to burst down, so I can't really argue with her placement. She's on the easier side of Sekiro's boss roster, but underestimate her at your own peril. Despite still viewing her as a pretty easy boss, Emma the Gentle Blade has actually managed to catch me off guard and even kill me a few times. While she has all the features of a really easy boss, like a simple moveset, low posture, and only one health bar, 
She does have moves like her grab and Ashina cross attack, which easily could, and in the case of the cross attack actually do, fit right into harder fights. And I feel that these set her out as a step above the other easy fights that she tends to be lumped in with. Of course, the real hardest parts about her fight are living with yourself for doing it, and getting through that absolutely brutal finisher without wincing. She's ultimately an easy fight with bursts of brilliance that remind you that even easy bosses in Sekiro are still harder than some of the toughest bosses in other Soulsborne titles. I've been pretty good at dodging Harashin across, but I won't deny when she lands that attack, it can spell the end of the run. Honestly, they should have just gone all the way and given her the Sword Saint gun so she'd have some more ranged utility. Sometimes simple is all you need. Emma makes the cool neurons in my brain activate. Overall, this game knows how to make things sick, but for some reason, Emma just does it for me. Guess I just like girl bosses like Maria. Gotta let those queens slay, am I right? There's just something special about seeing badass women doing badass things. I'd love to see more women in future titles that kick ass. Melania, Renala, and Rolana really carrying Elden Ring in that regard. We need more. At number 10, we have Genichiro Ashina's Tutorial Fight, who scored a total average of 5.68 out of 10. I decided to add this fight on the poll as a whim, as I don't think I've ever really ranked it before in any of my major Sekiro videos. But if I keep the vanguard from Demon Souls in with its similar premise, Genichiro Ashina's tutorial deserves a spotlight as well. There are two ways to tackle this fight, either on a new game file, where all you have is your sword and a dream, or a new game plus file, where you have access to your skill tree and prior knowledge. The fight is exactly the same as his encounter at Ashina Castle, just without the way of Tomoe form, and the way nobody could decide on how to rank this fight was hilarious to me. It got double digit votes in all 10 voting categories, not a single other fight on this list managed that. Obviously, if you fight him on new game, even on a repeat playthrough, there's one major obstacle you have to overcome. No Mikiri counter. Having to unlearn the instinct to dodge into thrusting attacks led to me getting killed on my recorded run, and I'm certain it's happened to others in the community too. While coming back on New Game Plus allows you to absolutely flex on this man. Makiri counter, reflect those arrows, dodges sweeps, and get that alternate post-fight cutscene. You deserve it, Queen. I was surprised of how high I put the Genichiro tutorial, but if you think about it, you're basically fighting a mid-game boss fight with less heals and without the resurrect option. I genuinely doubt anyone did this boss the first time they played without knowledge at the very least. If there is someone who beat Genichiro's tutorial on their first ever playthrough, I've yet to see it. Logically, there's gotta be someone out there who's managed it. If you're out there, let me know. I agree with the assessment though. Mid-game boss, barely any heals, and somehow I always forget that this game has a resurrect system. It's in the name, why do I forget that? At number 9, we have Genichiro Ashina, who scored a total average of 6.44 out of 10. For to top Ashina Castle, this is the defining moment for Sekiro playthroughs where you're either going to get good or going to get out. There's a level of respect this fight has, to the point where it's the only boss on the poll to receive zero votes for least favourite fight. The first two phases play out the same as Genichiro's tutorial appearance. He has a wide variety of sword slashing combos he can break out when in melee range, while from afar he can whip out his bow to strike you as you're trying to heal. You can't dodge your way around his attacks due to his level of aggression and tracking, which means your only means of defense are to deflect everything you can. His perilous thrusts are mixed into various combos to keep you on your toes, whether it's Makiri countering a thrust, jumping over a sweep, or dodging backwards to avoid his grab. He's designed to teach you the optimal way to play Sekiro, and with that comes a lot of growing pains for the player as they learn to adapt to his playstyle. On my first playthrough, he had me in a chokehold, as I was still playing Sekiro like it was a Dark Souls game. It wasn't until I managed to hit the wavelength the game was after that I started having success. He's also the first boss to have three phases in the game, with his way of Tomoe form being a glass cannon. He has access to his usual attacks, but he now has a jumping lunge you can Makiri counter, and lightning attacks you can reversal to deal great posture damage. 
This extra wrinkle added onto the boss fight raises his difficulty compared to his tutorial variant, and ensures that you're locked in from beginning to end. He's the third favourite boss on this poll, with 33 votes for a reason. Genichiro Ashina Castle isn't my favourite, but I do think he's essential for any new player, since he's the first true wall to learning Sekiro's combat. Any boss before him you could cheese or use other strats, but he's the first that really makes you learn how to play properly. Once you beat him, you can beat the rest of the game. Still a challenge, but now you know how to actually play the game rather than spamming Firecracker every few seconds. The fact that Genichiro doesn't have any underlying weaknesses to any shinobi tools definitely makes him a dangerous foe. A majority of the bosses in this game have something that you can exploit to counter them, and I really appreciate that with Genichiro, there isn't anything to outright break his challenge. FromSoft understood that he needed to be there as a legitimate wall to ensure players were learning the right lessons from the game, and that difficulty is so respectable. He's just difficult enough to force you to learn how to properly parry and Makiri counter, getting you out of the Dark Souls mindset. Afterwards he becomes pretty easy, which is wild since he kicked her ass just a few hours ago in the tutorial. He may not be the hardest boss, but he is the perfect difficulty for when you fight him. The inner version adds Sakura Dance, which makes him harder again, and is in my opinion the best boss in the game, slightly above Ishin. Genichiro feels like when you crest a hill, and you get that lovely slope downwards after. His difficulty hits a peak, and then suddenly you can do his fight in your sleep. While I still haven't beaten inner Genichiro, I definitely think his fight is the one I could learn, because I'm so familiar with his base game battle. Definitely one of the best fights to showcase Wolf's rise in power in the early game. Genichiro is a weird one difficulty-wise. On one hand, he's a firm blockade going out of the early game that is meant to test everything you've learned up until that point, and in that regard he's definitely daunting for newcomers. For repeated playthroughs, you begin to realise how easy it is to spam Genichiro to death, and how the fight gets much easier in Phase 2 once you have a better grasp on lightning reversal. So in the grand scheme of the game, I'd ranked him at a 6. Perfect for upping the difficulty, at first, and perfect for showing how far you've come once you beat him again, before the much more difficult Sword Saint. Sekiro has, and always will be, a game about confidence. Are you confident in your ability to handle bosses in the moment? If you are, you'll find being aggressive tends to work against a vast majority of the roster, even up until the very final boss of the game, and Genichiro is no exception. I do love when I bully him into a corner in a flow state where he can't do shit to harm me. I do wish he'd made it into the top half of the rankings, but I respect where he's ended up. Oh, it seems like you caught me while I'm exercising to get better at parrying in Sekiro. That being said, if I can take a quick moment of your time, we are trying to reach 30,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I think it's doable, I think it's possible. If you enjoy this video, and by the end of it you want to see more, consider parrying that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of my future videos, or consider going the extra mile and become a channel member. You get early access to future videos, you get a shout out in the description and at the end of every video as well, and it's just really cool, 4 99 a month, back to the Sekiro community ranking. At number 8, we have the True Corrupted Monk, who scored a total average of 6.84 out of 10. Fun fact, numbers 8 through 6 on this list only have a 0.06 difference between their total average scores, so you can make a case for any of the next three fights being harder than the other. The True Corrupted Monk likely lands at number 8 though because of two reasons, the obvious being that the first phase is just a repeat of the Mibu Village boss fight, except now you're a bit stronger and you've had more experience with the moveset. This means it's surprisingly easy to burst through this first part of the fight to get to the new stuff. Then there's the second phase, where you can immediately death blow the boss at the very start into phase 3, by going to a very specific branch in the arena. Most players know about this tactic, meaning the 3 phase boss fight is basically a 2 phase boss fight, leaving the difficulty to come from the final health bar. If you choose to face her without going for that cheesy death blow, you'll be dealing with a series of shadowy illusions you have to dodge through until the spell ends. Then it's the usual fight until you either get her to phase 3 or she uses the illusion spell again. In the third phase, the true corrupted monk begins to utilise the centipede living within her to attack. 
Her moveset remains the same, except she becomes more aggressive as a result, and certain attacks allow her to shoot toxic poison that quickly builds up your terror. I've died to this before, it sucks, but once you know the pattern for it, you can sidestep the goo relatively easily. Her spin to win attack returns in all its deflectable glory, though as it turns out, the true corrupted monk has a surprising weakness to firecrackers. You can stun lock her by firecrackering, hitting her four times, then firecracker again, rinse and repeat until she goes down. This is crazy to me because Gyobu, the first boss of the game, gained stun resistance the more you used firecrackers, and yet the true corrupted monk near the end of the game doesn't? This had to be an intentional choice on part of the developers. She's easily one of the tougher fights in the game, and yet she ends up being one of the easiest to cheese through various means. And that's why I think she lands at number 8 instead of higher on the list. How did our voters enjoy her true experience? I recently finished a base vitality playthrough of Kuro's Charm that basically solidified how I feel about the difficulty of the bosses from all my previous playthroughs. The exception, however, was True Corrupted Monk. She was the biggest roadblock for me, even harder than Ishin. She deals a lot of posture damage, vitality damage, and builds up terror. Combined with her odd timings, like on the multi-swing circle attack, her delays, and her out-of-nowhere retaliations, she nearly ended my run. Even being able to skip her second phase, I only just barely beat her. Oh boy, a base vitality playthrough sounds like a true test of skill. Add to that Kuro's charm, and I can see why she'd be a roadblock. Many bosses have multiple phases, and yet none have such a vastly different moveset as the true corrupted monk. I can beat her because I enjoy using my tools and exploits to gain victory, it feels like I've earned a reward for adapting to the game's rules. But your challenge run? Yeah, your feelings are valid. The True Corrupted Monk feels like one of the most underrated bosses in the series. Despite sharing a big chunk of her moveset with her inferior ghost version, I think she's an excellent fight. Her moveset is extremely satisfying to learn, with swipes, thrusts, and sweeps that lets the player use most of the tools in their arsenal to best her, and despite being an unpopular opinion, I also enjoy her second phase teleporting attacks. The fight taking place on a stunning bridge arena is just icing on the cake. Great fight. Underrated? I can see it. I wouldn't say she's the most underrated boss in the game, as she was on all the pre-release marketing for Sekiro and was one of the bosses we were all looking forward to when we got our hands on it, but she's definitely a tad forgotten when compared to some of the other late to end game fights, all of which made it further on this list. I'm probably in the minority having True Corrupted Monk as my favourite boss, but the setting and rhythm of that fight is just too good for me to disregard. I love that you can just outright skip the second phase with a little bit of stealth. It helps it to not feel overwhelming as a required fight. That's one of my favourite things about Sekiro in general, there's a very smooth difficulty curve. True Corrupted Monk is definitely one of the best supernatural fights in the game, and that setting, as you say, is phenomenal. It's nice to see people framing the ability to exploit her as a positive and not this game-breaking bug, as I honestly think it gives these fights a lot of character. At number 7, we have the Guardian Ape, who scored a total average of 6.86 out of 10. When I started this poll, I knew that the ape would land in the top half of the list, but I was surprised to see its gank version was ranked higher. I'd have swapped the two around myself, but I digress. This is the first boss in the game where both phases of the fight are incredibly distinct, with two completely unique movesets that don't rely on each other in the slightest. The first half is this primal battle against a ferocious ape hell-bent on protecting a flower within its cave. He's got a series of combos that can be very difficult to avoid due to his high aggression. Often you'll be waiting until the very end of a combo, either by blocking or just running away until it finishes, so you can punish and do health damage. Because believe me, phase one, you're not death blowing this guy with posture. He also has toxic poop that he can throw at you, which is just the most disgusting yet accurate move I've seen from software develop. Oh, and then there's the poop cloud, just... <clears throat> I'm really not a fan of these attacks, it's not my cup of tea. Phase 1 is a game of patience, because once you reach the second half of the fight, you've got far more opportunities to exploit the boss. 
The centipede inside the creature takes control, with the headless ape's movements becoming erratic and serpentine, but he gains a sword. It comes with more traditional attacks you can block and counter. If you've got the spear prosthetic tool, it can be used to cause massive posture damage when the ape is stunned, yanking that demonic centipede out for massive damage. The main attack you need to watch out for is the Terror Shriek. If it builds up to full, you're dead. But as long as you run the moment you see the attack coming, you will survive. It's a challenge of learning two movesets, and knowing that compared to the rest of the roster, you're facing a beast that cannot be predicted. At least firecrackers work for phase one, they go hand in hand with animals. But does this fight go hand in hand with the voters? I believe Guardian Ape is an S tier fight. While I think he gets proper respect within the community, I often feel he's underrated. The Phase 1 moveset perfectly embodies the feeling of fighting a wild creature, while Phase 2 feels wacky and unique once he gains a sword. In terms of difficulty, he's very challenging, but he never feels like he's too much. I love how the fight gives me two unique movesets to learn and overcome. Also, that phase change transition never gets old for me, and maybe my favourite transition from FromSoft. I'd say Guardian Ape is underrated in the sense that if you're not a humanoid boss in Sekiro, you're underrated. I'm guilty of this myself, as I also ranked Guardian Ape fairly low in my boss ranking video, but I also just vastly prefer his Phase 2 to his Phase 1. But that doesn't change how well designed he is. He's challenging, but you've got such a large arena to move around in, you always can give yourself space if you need to heal or back off. And that phase transition, as you said, is complete genius. The first phase is really fun on its own, it makes you feel like fighting an actual beast. The beheading animation is sick, like the rest of the finishes in the game, and the revival took me by surprise on my first playthrough. But what makes this boss fight truly shine for me is how satisfying the second phase feels. The marionette-like animations and wide swings have some wind-up time that feel a lot more natural than the direction FromSoft went after this, and of course we can't forget the overhead slash that has enough force to push you away when you parry. Plus, I like monkeys. Once again, it's the duality of the fight being praised here. Two distinct but largely competent movesets that don't overstay their welcome and have their own ways to handle them. In that sense, I can see why Guardian Ape didn't crack it higher in the list, but I wish it did. At number 6, we have the Headless Ape and his Bride, who scored a total average of 6.9 out of 10. Nice. As well as a whopping 210 votes for Least Favourite Boss. On top of that, he's the only boss fight outside of Tutorial Genichiro to receive zero votes for favourite boss on the poll. So hot take, I'm actually shocked the gank fight lands above the solo fight. I'm not saying that it isn't a hard encounter, dealing with the Headless Ape again is one thing, but having his bride who uses the regular Guardian Ape moveset appearing on his second health bar is another thing entirely. My only strategy for this fight is to go towards the Bride immediately and just spam my firecrackers. Posture fuck that diva until you can get that death blow and breathe a sigh of relief. Because at this point, you faced Headless Ape before, you know his moveset. It's just about getting him alone again to finish him off. It's a shame he's reused so quickly after his initial encounter, as if you choose to do the Guardian 8 before Mibu Village, you have no choice but to fight him to progress the story. Do it the other way around, and you can completely skip this encounter, which might just make it the easiest boss in the game, one you don't have to do, am I right? Trying to fight these guys toolless sounds like a recipe for disaster, and their movesets don't complement each other in the slightest. It's just a lazy rehash designed to pad out the boss roster when the game really didn't need it. And yet with the firecracker trick, this fight isn't hard in the slightest to me, it's just annoying. So I find it insane that it ranks this high on the list, when I'd say it's got the easiest exploit out of the lot to win albeit not a very refined or confident exploit. Voters, would you care to elaborate on your decisions? I feel as though what makes the Headless Ape and his Bride to be the easiest boss is simply because it's nothing new. The original Guardian Ape fight was a perfect challenge to overcome. This Jiro fight on the other hand feels like unnecessary padding. Having already known the moveset, it doesn't feel new or fun. I even beat it on my first ever attempt. 
Honestly, adding a second date wasn't a good enough change to validate this boss fight. A shame, really. A lot could have been changed to make it more difficult. FromSoft just didn't take the chance. Okay, so I'm not delusional. There are some voters out there that see my point of view. I just really wanted to highlight that first before I go crazy. So now on to people batting for the other team. I really wanted to like the second ape fight. Seeing the ape bend backwards to reveal that it still had no head terrified me, but also made me laugh the first time around. I can't get over the missed opportunity of having a situation where the attacks from both apes came out one after the other. Parrying each ape in succession would have easily made that fight my favorite in the game. Instead, I kind of hate it. The fight feels really sloppy. I don't like fighting the bride and getting either stabbed or slammed by the guardian at the same time. I often forget that I can use prosthetic tools during boss fights except when I fight these two. I rush to use oil and the flame vent to take out the bride just so I can experience the second phase of the guardian ape fight. Again. <laughs> so the difficulty stems from their movesets failing to overlap, I definitely see that. Even with tools on your side, there's still no guarantee that you'll be able to take the bride out before the headless ape finds a way to stick his sword where the sun don't shine. And Sekiro is a game that prides itself on its 1v1 encounters, so I can see why dealing with multiple enemies can boost that difficulty. I personally think that the double ape fight resembles more of an assault than an actual fair fight. While the first phase is easy and fun to master, it all goes out of the window as soon as the brown ape joins in. The arena is small, they have massive hitboxes, don't hold back at all to give you a window to heal or retaliate, and they almost strategically combine their attacks to fuck you over as much as possible as if they were sentient beings. Even using all the items and tools the game gives you, they can and will find a way to corner you and give your internal organs some fresh air. Worst of all, it's not even fun bad and laughable, it's just frustrating and lazy. Sure you can skip it, but then why is this the only main boss that drops prayer beads? And how are you supposed to know that you can leave them out on a first playthrough? It almost feels like they knew nobody would actually bother fighting them, so they locked valuable items like the ceremonial tanto behind them. I really love From Software's boss design, and the Guardian Ape really is a fun and uniquely designed fight, but a big issue is trying to enhance the game's difficulty by copy-pasting a unique boss into an unfair situation to squeeze out 30 more minutes of pure pain and agony. They are unpredictable, unlearnable, and unfair. Which is all that you need in a game that's about mastering a rewarding combat system, am I right? Sorry for the ramblings, keep up the good work, Billy. Yeah, I have nothing to add. I think this sums up the fight perfectly, serving as a lovely way to end this entry. Thank you so much for the kind words, Voter. At number 5, we have Great Shinobi Owl, who scored a total average of 7.14 out of 10. One of my personal favourite fights in the game, the first Owl fight showcases exactly what it's like to fight another Shinobi who isn't afraid to use all the tools in their arsenal to come out on top. His sword combos hit slow and hard, with a force that only someone of Al's stature can muster, but it's everything he weaves between his moveset that creates a true sense of danger. Most attack strings have him using Shuriken to try and stun you in the interim. He flips around the arena, isn't afraid to use his mobility to his vantage. Some combos are also followed up with gunpowder, which acts like our own shinobi firecrackers, meaning you have to not only avoid his combos, but the follow-ups at the end as well. His most evil technique, though, is his Shinobi Charm. It has a very slow wind-up animation, but if you're within range of this miniature bomb, it will stop you from being able to heal until the effect wears off. Definitely not something you want to deal with. After his first phase, he tries to pull a Dr. Wily and grovel for mercy, only to turn the tables with a smoke bomb and a few extra techniques. His combos now have a chance of throwing poison to the floor, which can be brutal to deal with. Combined with his already aggressive moveset and his ability to use more smoke screens, and you have a fight that will test whether you can surpass the man who raised you. Oh, and he can counter any thrust attacks, so don't. Just don't. He's not the fan favorite Al fight in the game, but he's still got his loyal fans. The way Great Shinobi Al fights like a true ninja with his many underhanded tactics makes for a unique and very fun challenge. Even though I prefer Al Father overall, this battle represents better how a ninja would fight. Saludos desde España. 
Gracias, gracias. Thank you for your comment. You're totally correct. Alfather may be the more entertaining boss fight from a challenge perspective, but I really think Great Shinobi Owl is perfectly themed to his character. He's underhanded, he doesn't care how he does it, he just gets results. And this is even felt in the tense music playing throughout, which aims to keep the player in suspense so they're more likely to make a mistake. So for the hardest boss, I put Great Shinobi Owl, and while for most of the ranking I put heavy bias towards my first playthrough, oh my god, this guy on New Game Plus 2 Charmless was the bane of my existence. He has super hefty attacks, can rack up chip damage insanely fast, and hardest of all in my opinion, his posture recovery is pretty nuts. You really have to damage him well before Clanking Swords starts actually whittling him down. Couple that with the super small arena that can't handle this massive fella and his area denial moves like firecrackers or poison globs, and it gets really hard to not feel under pressure the whole fight. Owl was one of the consistently tough fights regardless of what New Game Plus run I was on. His health is already rather intimidating, yet as the voter pointed out, his posture is nothing to slouch at either. He makes you work for your win in a way the other bosses on this ranking so far haven't quite done. And you have to do two death blows to finish him off. Whew, good luck to you. Especially when he's the only boss I know of in game who has perilous attacks that don't give off the red kanji warning. Now he's playing dirty. At number four, we have Ishin Ashina Shura, who scored a total average of 7.79 out of 10. And yet, even in fourth place in the ranking, he only received nine votes for hardest boss. You face him when attempting to reach the Shura ending by sticking to the Iron Code, which requires you to defeat Emma the Gentle Blade every time you refight him. But once defeated in the story, he can be accessed as a solo fight in the Gauntlets of Strength. Of the two Ishin variants in the game, this is definitely the easier fight, and I think most of us would agree there. He shares a lot of moves with Emma due to them using the Ashina fighting style, so her duel is preparing you for Ishin. And if you're going for the Shura ending on a New Game Plus run, you'll have a lot of experience with Ishin's first phase because his moveset is pretty similar to his Sword Saint Phase 1. The toughest part about the fight is how good he is at dodging away from your attacks. You have to catch him off guard or at the end of combos, and you can only get a few hits in at a time before he starts swerving away to avoid you in counter. The Ichimonji and Ichimonji double attacks, as well as the Ashina cross, are moves I love to dodge and punish because of their clear wind-up times. Now his phase one is difficult, but if that were the only part of the fight, Ishin wouldn't be this high on the list. It's his phase two where he begins to imbue all of his attacks with fire, where we start to panic. From his ability to launch fire trails across the floor that need to be jumped over, to his combos that have incredible reach and follow up flame attacks, to his signature move, One Mind, he's a force to be reckoned with. You have to ensure you stay away from the flames on the arena's floor, otherwise they'll burst up in pillars of fire, staggering you so Ishin can follow up with a flurry of sword slices to end your run. Even on my successful attempt, I found myself trapped in a corner at one point and killed, having to resurrect to ultimately get that win. He's aggressive, but once you understand his moveset, you can see just how many openings he leaves the player to punish. And that's the key to victory here. It's just one of the highest skill ceilings in the game, so that's a rather tall order. As for the voters... Shura Ishin is so much fun to fight. Him being more reserved and precise and not as aggressive makes a lot of sense for him being a few hours away from death. And his second phase fire attacks are all so fair and cool to dodge that since the update, he's easily the boss I've fought the most. A lot of people forget that this variant of Ishin is close to the end of his life. In the story, you go to Fountainhead Palace after this and then the old man bites the bullet. Yet here, he still has more than enough power and precision to go to town on you should you go for the game's bad ending. He still feels distinctly different from his other fight in a way I really appreciate, and it's good to see that sentiment being shared. People underestimate Fire Ishin, but he does some challenging things that other bosses don't do. For starters, his first phase is the only non-inner fight that has a move to punish aggression in his dodge and slash, which punishes a strategy that has worked extremely well in other parts of the game. His second phase also livens up his strongest first phase moves, where before you deflected them, now you must dodge them or get hit with a status effect. 
He also uses the arena as an obstacle, something no other non-gimmick fight does in Sekiro really, ever. This makes him one of the tougher fights. People sleep on this guy. His ability to inflict burn in the second phase is something I didn't touch upon earlier, but I knew a voter would mention it. Having the ability to render you in trouble due to status effects is threatening in a game like Sekiro where status effects aren't that plentiful to begin with. But if you have a full stock of dousing powder, you can pause the game and use it from the menu, giving you a small bit of breathing room. I do think people sleep on this boss in the sense that while I do feel I'd rank him fourth on this list as well, he deserves a few more votes for hardest boss than he actually got. Heck, I remember when Sekiro first came out, he was considered harder than some of the bosses above him until public opinion finally settled. At number three, we have Owl Father, who scored a total average of 8.7 out of 10. A fan favorite, he came in second with 71 votes for favorite Sekiro boss, and I understand the love. Owl Father is a chance to face off against your adoptive parent in a battle to see just how far you've come while he is at the peak of his strength. Especially after discovering that he's the reason why we're even infected with Kuro's blood, as he was the one who killed us after defeating Lady Butterfly in our memories. During this encounter, he drops the more underhanded tactics, like the poison sprays or the anti-healing bombs, in favor of a more aggressive fighting style. He still uses his shuriken and gunpowder, often to obscure his next attack, or used as a follow-up to a tough attack to stagger Wolf at the last second. And by god, this truly is a fight where you cannot cheese this man. Thrusting attacks will still get immediately parried, so don't even try. And if you're not playing aggressive, you won't get his health down to posture death blow him before he's able to kill you. His speed is enhanced, and more importantly, his attacks hit hard. One simple slash is enough to wipe out almost half your health bar, meaning you have to play perfectly to avoid wasting your healing gourd so you have a chance at the phase two. As once you get him to that point, he summons a spectral owl that he uses to confound and confuse the player. It will circle around the room as a passive creature, except when Owl incorporates it into his attacks. This can be used with him vanishing before reappearing where the Owl is flying, which often ends up behind the player, or how about his devastating Shadowfall move, where he launches the Owl at you as a flaming projectile, before following up with a thrusting move you can Makiri counter. Except I can never manage it because I'm always so out of place from dodging the Owl that I panic and dodge farther instead of countering. Top it off with Owl constantly trying to get out of your reach with various back steps and jumps, and you have a fight that can last a long time. I suspect this fight isn't as hard for players anymore because of it being a fan favorite fight, it meant more people would rematch him in the Gauntlet of Strength, meaning more people just got good at his moveset. Because I'm not at that point myself, I think he's my hardest fight in Sekiro, so I find myself a bit of an outlier seeing him in third place. He handed me my ass on my recorded run for hours after all. Alright voters, feel free to gush about your beloved father. Our father, in my opinion, has the least amount of cheese out of the hardest bosses. That's what makes him above Sword Saint and Demon of Hatred. On top of that, he has a less rhythmic feel that I find leads me to getting hit more often. I do think with the less predictable moves, he makes for a harder Phase 1, as Phase 2 Owl's moves are all very easy to avoid, and often give more opportunities than anything. Mention to Inner Owl for fixing this with less predictable Fire Owl, and also those awesome Raven Mist moves. God, everything I hear about the inner father fight has me in a cold sweat. I've definitely got to face him for a video one day, and I definitely agree with all your comments here. Sword Saint has a specific rhythm I'm used to, and Demon of Hatred's larger attacks are less complex than Owl's moveset, which makes him feel much harder to learn for me, especially when your muscle memory from Great Shinobi Owl doesn't give you that much of an advantage due to his enhanced aggression, and the fact that most of the safe combos from that fight are no longer safe in this one. His phase 2 definitely has more openings to take him down, but I find it's also the phase where it's easier to lose your nerve or make a silly mistake while fighting him. The closer you get to the end of the fight, the more likely you are to make an error in judgement, and that happened to me more than I care to admit. Alfava strikes the most perfect balance between difficulty and fairness of any FromSoft game in my opinion. 
His entire kit is designed to slowly learn his moveset, and on the winning try, you feel like a god who earned this win through and through. Every move he makes is a counter move. He moves fast, but not too fast, and leaves room between attacks to internalize the moveset. Too many bosses string attack chains together, making the learning aspect of a boss often unpredictable and precarious, but Owl Father has a smooth but challenging learning curve that feels all the more satisfying for it. There are no lucky kills here, no shortcuts, only skill. There's nothing like it. And that's what I think is so special about Sekiro's best bosses. Owl Father, Great Shinobi Owl, Sword Saint, they all give you the time to learn each of their movesets, as it's the only way to really get ahead when these fights are harder to traditionally cheese. Sekiro asks so much of the player in comparison to other Souls games, it's honestly insane, but it leads to some of the most satisfying victories you will ever have in a video game. And Owl Father, being the secret hidden super boss, exemplifies this perfectly. While the Sword Saint has a more varied moveset, Owl Father was more difficult for me because he can react to what you do. One example is his overhead slash. If you dodge to his side, he'll turn it into a sweep. If you dodge backwards, he'll jump at you. His flaming owl and thrusting attacks were extremely difficult to counter because the spacing had to be perfect. You just end up being giga defensive during this fight and you sometimes get the occasional jab in on him. He just doesn't open himself up for really complex ways for you to twist his head off, it's all about perfecting the sword play and not making a single mistake. And don't get me started on the difficulty in New Game Plus. And that's exactly why the fight works. Alfather doesn't give the player an inch, you've got to meet him at his own game and make those incredibly tight openings count when they present themselves, while never getting complacent in the process. Bosses that are able to chain up their combos to react to the player are some of the most terrifying types to encounter, and even for From Software, they're incredibly rare. But Alfather is likely the best of the bunch. My personal hardest fight in Sekiro too. At number 2, we have the Demon of Hatred, who scored a total average of 9.23 out of 10. It was a close fought race between him and our number 1, with him receiving 134 votes for Hardest Boss, to our number 1's 136 votes. But you've spoken, and the Bloodborne Beast that found its way to Feudal Japan is your Silver Medalist. Oh, Demon of Hatred, how I love and hate you. On my first playthrough, fighting the Demon of Hatred was an extremely fun change of pace. He fights like Dark Souls beasts, and the tactics you've used to succeed up to this point don't work in the face of such overwhelming power. As such, when I bested him then, it felt like I'd overcome something truly spectacular. Then on my recorded playthrough, I had the opposite experience. Getting clipped by fire attacks I could have sworn I'd avoided, getting flung up into the air by that one perilous sweep attack that comes out so fast I can never react to it, and just overall struggling a lot more with the moveset and his devastating three phases. Even with the flame umbrella and its counter move, as well as the malcontent whistle for the stagger opportunities, the demon of hatred doesn't let up because those items only work for as long as you have spirit emblems, so you have to play aggressive to end the fight before you run out of your extra offensive tools. I love the variety to his moveset, but I do think it's less complex than some of the smaller humanoid bosses in the game. That being said, when their attacks hit, oh, they hit hard and wipe you out. It means you're going to be spending a lot of time recovering, which isn't a fun feeling by any means. Public opinion on this boss is mixed, leaning negative, because like myself, most players prefer when Sekiro's 1v1s are against less overwhelming foes, where they can deflect and parry and counter attacks. Voters, share your hatred with me! <laughs> the Demon of Hatred is, to this day, the second boss fight in a Souls game that had me accept using some sort of cheese on my first playthrough, using Suzaku's Lotus Umbrella during the fight and Malcontent to skip the third phase. It's a late game optional fight that throws everything you've learned about the game out of the window, choosing to fight more along the lines of a Bloodborne boss, and you're discouraged from parrying its attacks since if they aren't perfect parries, you will burn. And parries won't give you openings either, as similarly to the Guardian Ape, it continues its attack regardless. The fight is also very time consuming, as the main way to get him low is through the health bar and not the posture bar. Pair that with the three phases, and you have the toughest endurance battle in the game besides Inner Father. 
On repeat playthroughs, I can consistently win on my first few attempts without resorting to any cheese, but the first time around was very different. The emotional payoff you get at the end of the fight when you realize who you've put to rest is a very special moment as well. Hot take, Suzaku's Lotus Umbrella isn't cheese for Demon of Hatred. It's a valid tool that helps to mitigate some of the fire attacks and gives you brilliant counter opportunities. Malcontent for actually being able to stun the boss I could see as being cheesy, but the umbrella is just us deciding we don't want to burn to death for three hours, and that's okay. Definitely love the reveal that the Demon of Hatred was actually the sculptor, gives a nice emotional weight to your actions, and combined with the euphoria of getting through the boss fight, it's a wonderful payoff. Demon of Hatred is the hardest boss for me because of his massive health bar and that he encourages dodging and sprinting instead of deflecting, which almost no other bosses or mini-bosses do except for the ogre and maybe the guardian ape. You basically have to forget everything you've learned and get used to a completely different kind of secular combat. Still really like this boss, and it's also cool you fight the Demon of Hatred in the same arena as Gyobu the Demon. Honestly, the sprinting speed in Sekiro is such an underappreciated tool that the player has up their sleeve. It's able to get you out of a ton of messy moments in various boss fights, and the overworld in general. I'm glad we have a few fights on the roster that challenge this type of gameplay. If the Sword Saint and Owl Father are the hardest fights to test Sekiro's traditional combat encounters, Demon of Hatred is the hardest fight to test Sekiro's non-traditional combat encounters. And he does that relatively well. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but I can't say the fight is badly executed or anything. Demon of Hatred is the most disappointing secret boss I've ever tracked down. Story-wise and visually, it's great, but the actual fight is entirely counter to the design of Sekiro. Throw out all your parry practice, cause this boss is a Dark Souls boss and you gotta dodge and smack that booty. Add in the extremely ambiguous hitbox on the very deadly charge attack, and I had absolutely no fun beating this one. Yeah, I totally get why you wouldn't like this boss. I understand that it's a hard counter to what Sekiro's gameplay is, and that charge attack is bullshit. But it's always been the point, and I disagree that it doesn't work with Sekiro's combat system. It's just you have to come up with entirely different strategies to take home the victory here. This voter doesn't enjoy that change of pace, they're entitled to their opinion, I definitely get it. I just think that using the it's against what we've been taught argument is a bit dated when it's so clear that's the developer's intention. It's not an accident or a bad mistake, it's a conscious choice they made and they still give you various tools to succeed here and mitigate your own difficulty to an extent with the umbrella and the whistle. But maybe that's just me. At number one, we have Ishin the Sword Saint, who scored a total average of 9.29 out of 10, with a whopping 175 votes for favorite boss. We've had a lot of final bosses over the years, and more often than not, they don't end up living up to the difficulty you'd expect from that title. Ishii and the Sword Saint, however, is definitely an exception to the rule. He is absolutely brutal, a gauntlet of four phases that requires you to play at the top of your game from start to finish. You begin with a brief fight against Genichiro Way of Tomoe, except now he has a mortal blade of his own. You might die to him once out of negligence, but he becomes just a regular enemy to beat down in 20 seconds before you get to the real fight after a few attempts. Ishin the Sword Saint, upon crawling out of Genichiro's neck, takes up his sword and, in his prime, begins to wage war against the player. Phase 1 is similar to the Ishin Ashina Shura fight, where he'll use all the moves from the Ashina Arts skill tree. My strategy was always to stay in close and sidestep to the left or right whenever attacks came out, and with that you're able to punish most of his hard-hitting moves like the Ichimonji or the Ashina Cross. Aside from a few wind slice attacks with deceptive timings, practice will get you through this phase quicker and quicker. He was bloody hard on my first go around though, let me tell you. Phase 2 is where I struggle, as he pulls out a massive spear that changes up his moveset drastically. Some of his attacks are easier to counter since he has a few more thrusting moves, but overall I find it harder to approach Ishin in this state, and the fight often turned into me running away and waiting for a move I knew I could punish. Of course, this won't stop him from pulling out his secret weapon, a fucking gun, to dome you in the head if you're not careful, 
more From Software bosses should have a gun to take down the player. Melania coming out of Waterfowl only to pull out an AK. Mikola wielding a gun while riding atop Radan. Manus opening his mouth to reveal a rocket launcher. Suralon pulling out a sniper rifle the moment you enter the arena. Gale launching a tactical nuke. You can't tell me that wouldn't be funny. Phase 3 focuses on the same attacks from Phase 2, except now there's the potential for lightning reversals. The issue is that with the uneven layout of the arena, if you and Ishin are positioned on different height levels, there's a high chance you won't be able to pull off a lightning reversal before you hit the ground, meaning you'd take all that damage yourself. With four health bars to deplete including Genichiro, it's just so easy to lose your nerve and choke during the final fight. And that's what makes it feel like the hardest fight in Sekiro. This man is brutal, and he knows how to fight while remaining aggressive. Plus, most Sekiro players have faced him compared to our second and third place bosses who are technically optional encounters. I suspect that shifted public perception as well, but that's just a theory. I'm not saying the thing. Voters, for the last time, take it away. Sword Saint Ishin is my favourite boss in the game purely because of how perfect he is as a final boss. He acts as a final exam, testing each of the skills you've gathered throughout your adventure in Ashina. You need to be quick on your feet and quicker on your reflexes, since his attacks, especially in Phase 2 and 3, can get quite hectic. Every time you lose against him, he utters the key to beating him, the famous, or infamous, hesitation is defeat. That is not a simple death quote, that is advice. He is aggressive, so you need to be aggressive yourself. Staying on top of him and avoiding passivity will let you drain his posture quickly. His difficulty is somewhat diminished though by the lightning attacks in Phase 3. You're basically given free damage whenever he uses them. Ishin overall is one of the best boss fights this game has, though there are arguably better bosses like Father Owl and Inner Father for that matter, I still hold Ishin in high regard for serving as a fantastic climax to the story and the whole game. The trick to beating Ishin, as this voter explains, is to just harass the man until he dies. If you stay aggressive, there's only so much he can do to counter you that you haven't already seen. Sekiro eats passive players for breakfast, and you don't want to be vored by Ishin Ashina, do you? Even though he faces Sekiro as per his grandson's wish, there's always been this story element that Ishin knows Wolf is going to win the fight. In fact, he wants him to win, and I think that master-pupil dynamic pays dividends with this fight. I didn't put Ishin the Sword Saint as my hardest boss, and on most days I would not even put it in my top three. The reason is that he's, in my opinion, the easiest boss in the game to cheese. Genichiro is just easy peasy and dies in seconds, Ishin's first phase is the hardest one but it's pretty easy to deflect, in phase 2 and 3 he does 2 to 3 different attacks when you're far away, he can shoot his glock, he can do wind swipes phase 3, and he can jump. It's incredibly easy to just run around like a rooster, or chicken if you prefer, and wait for him to jump, dodge behind and hit him twice, or even mortal blade his scrawny ass. After that it's rinse and repeat and maybe put in a lightning encounter every now and then. I'm sure the boss can be the most difficult if you fight him fair and square, but you don't have to. And when I rank difficulty, being able to cheese a boss definitely lowers that boss's ranking. At least in my book. I'll leave a final remark. There are three bosses that actually make me nervous to fight, and Ishin the Sword Saint is not one of them. We love a contrarian in these rankings. While I don't think I'd say exploiting Ishin's AI like that is a cheese method, I do agree that of the hardest fights on today's video, he's the one I'm least afraid to fight again. I've taken him on enough times now that it's like greeting an old friend, passing an exam I've done already, just me popping in to top up my license. I think because he's mandatory to complete the game, they went a tad easier on his moveset than that of Al Father or Demon of Hatred, but I'll point out again that some of Ishin's more punishable attacks still come with an asterisk. Unless you're confident, I don't see everyone going for those lightning reversals with the level of risk they carry if you fuck up, for example. Ultimately, the debate on whether the Sword Saint is the hardest fight in Sekidor will rage on for a long time after this video is posted, and both sides are valid. However, today, you've ranked him your number one hardest boss in Sekidor, Shadows Die Twice.
And that's my list. Which Sekiro boss was your hardest? Let me know down below and be sure to parry that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of my future videos. Next up, it's the basic Elden Ring community ranking for the base game. I'm still debating on whether to include the Shadow of the Erdtree bosses in there as well because we already did a community ranking for them, so let me know your thoughts down below. My social medias are on screen now, feel free to follow where you feel comfortable, I recommend my Twitter or my Discord, my Twitter is the best place to go, or my YouTube community tab, we love it there. Massive shout out to my YouTube channel members for supporting me for another month, you guys are amazing, thank you so much, and I'll see you guys next time for another video. Adios!